Our next destination is along one of London's best-known streets, the Strand. It's only a short walk from Temple Tube Station and an even shorter walk from Fleet Street. Now by far the largest building here is the Royal Courts of Justice, built in grand Victorian Gothic style. But right opposite is probably the smallest premises on the Strand, and it's also a listed monument. Twinings, the oldest tea shop in London. It's almost a museum inside. The shelves are packed with teas from around the world, and above are portraits depicting generations of the Twining family who've run the business. Unbelievably, Corporate Relations Director Stephen Twining represents the 10th generation today. I meet Julia, the store's senior brand ambassador. The shop that you're standing in now was um, opened in 1706 as Tom's Coffee House. So not many people realise, but we actually did start in coffee, even though we're so synonymous with tea nowadays. At this point in London, we were mainly drinking coffee. There are about 2,000 coffee houses around the centre of London, and tea was sort of nowhere to be seen at this point. It was maybe just starting to come into England in about sort of 1650s. And Thomas Twining basically decided through his connections with the East India Company to start selling a small amount of tea in the shop as well that people could come and drink, but also they could take small amounts of it home with them. And this is quite groundbreaking at the time. So by, by having this, he actually ended up selling his tea to other coffee houses as well. So he was very business savvy in the very, very first generation. It's quite extraordinary. And we're still here today. And where you can see behind me, this section basically was Tom's coffee house. Thomas Twain then started to do very, very well in his business as a whole, and tea was really what was taking off. And by 1717, we had a doorway onto the Strand properly. Um, and this is referred to as the Golden Lion, so that celebrated its 300th anniversary last year. That's the baby of the shop, if you like. And that's why it's a very, very long, thin corridor, because Thomas Twining basically kept buying houses until he had a doorway on the Strand. Now this is very important because he put us in a much more prestigious location in London because even though this is after the Great Fire of London and all the very, very wealthy families had moved out of the centre, they still came here to do their shopping. So by having that doorway on the Strand, it meant that everybody knew that Twinings was the place to go and actually get your tea from. And what he started to notice when he had the doorway on the Strand was actually his best customers were women. And this is something that he'd never even thought of before because when it was still a coffee house, women were not allowed to enter. But he started seeing carriages parking outside the front of the shop and male servants coming in and buying the tea for the ladies of the house. And Thomas realised if he could allow women to come into the shop, then he stood to make a great deal more money, we'll say, and actually had the business take off fully. So he referred to the shop instead of Tom's Coffee House as the Golden Lion Tea and Coffee House. And from then on, it meant that women were allowed to enter. It meant it's a little bit more um, uh, dignified for ladies to come and do her shopping. And at this point, there would be huge chests of tea all around the shop, and the ladies would come and smell the different teas, and either buy small amounts to take home themselves, because blending in the home happened from the very beginning, or Thomas would blend them specific blends just for them as well. So it was really a very exciting time for tea. And if you could afford to buy tea, because tea at this point was so incredibly expensive, it's 119% tax upon the price of tea, which if you think about it, um, maybe like 100 grams of sort of classic gunpowder green tea would have sold for 180 pounds in today's money in the shop. So very, very expensive. So if you could afford to have tea, you would have a craft and make you a beautiful tea caddy and you would keep it locked away so the servants couldn't go anywhere near it. Um, you didn't trust them to make your tea for you. And even though it was mainly for tea, later on when sugar became very expensive, sugar was locked away with it as well. But the lady of the house made the tea herself. It was never seen as a chore, never at all. What can customers do in the shop today? Well, the shop is open seven days a week, and what we do is we actually have a tea bar at the back of the shop. Now, unless the tea bar is closed for a private masterclass, we have it open for the customers to come and taste any tea they would like in the shop at all. We have about 150-ish teas in the shop for you to taste, and all of our premium loose leaf tea is only sold in this shop or on our UK and Ireland website. 
and we give you opportunities to taste all of it at the tea bar. We make sort of iced mocktails, um, which I cold infuse, try and make it as special as possible. We also have a museum at the back of the shop. We have some artefacts in there. We have our Royal Warrant from Queen Victoria from 1837. We have a variety of different tea caddies and some history on the Twining family. Because Twining secured a royal warrant many years ago, it's natural to see commemorative blends displayed on the shelf. And here's a familiar box from the past. A tip placed in here first was to ensure promptness. There isn't enough time for me to take a masterclass, but Julia has invited me to choose one of their premium teas from around the world to taste. Yes. Mango and ginger. Oh, gosh, that's strong. After some deliberation, I settle on one of Twining's best known blends, Earl Grey. So I'll put one teaspoon in here because this is our international tasting china. Mm -hmm. We can get to slurp it in a bit. So we tend to get the water just below the boil, we don't really want it to be at boiling point. There's a theory that actually what you could do is you end up burning the tea leaves as a whole or it ends up reducing the amount of sort of um, amino acids and chemicals and things that you naturally have in the water and you lose them through the steam so you don't get such a nice cup of tea. Again, as a whole. that's something I always insisted on yeah. kettle must boil. So if I put up here and I'll set the timer. So we say sort of between three and four minutes for a black tea is quite nice. So so we have the taste chai, so we let it brew. So you don't play with it, you don't stir it. So this is loose leaf, so mm -hmm. loose leaf we let brew for maybe three to four minutes for black tea. If it was a tea bag, I'd say two to three minutes. Oh, okay. Most people tend to let it maximum 30 seconds <laughs> brew for, and then they just want to take it out as quickly as possible. And we don't trust the tea bag. So everyone has to stir the tea bag and squeeze it against the side. The yes. tea bag has been designed in a way to brew perfectly. And it was designed as far back as 1908 by accident by a gentleman called Thomas Sullivan, who's an American merchant, who used to actually pop his tea leaves into tiny little pouches to send them. And people not realising this popped it straight into the pot. So that's where the tea bag first came okay, from. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Yes. But the best thing, I think, is actually, look at things like this. This is a type of Earl Grey that we blended, more for an international market. It's got lemon peel in it as well. But this is a loose leaf but it's actually put into like a little silky mesh bag. Yeah. So that means you have the best of both worlds. So you can brew it as a loose leaf tea, mm. but then you don't have any of the difficulty of being like, well, what do I do with the tea leaves? How do they strain mm. as you pop it in, you let it infuse and then you throw it away. They do say as well that as soon as you sort of have um, boiled up or below the boil with your kettle, as soon as you then add it to a teapot, it cools it down. As soon as you then add it to your teacup, it cools it down again as well because you're putting it okay. in different vessels. Yes. So warming the pot as a whole is probably quite a good idea. Um, and that's a nice tradition. Mm. But the tradition of one for the pot is not a nice tradition. <laughs> not, okay. Because that, I think, just ends up making it very bitter. Mm -hmm. um, it's not ideal, really. Now for the slurp. Because what you want to do is you want to try and get it into the back of your taste buds. Mm -hmm. And then the best thing to do is if you hold it in your mouth just for a second and let it sort of sit on your tongue and then swallow. I was always taught not to slurp. I know. You're allowed to here, just here. <laughs> here we go. That's very good. And can you see how you get more of this feeling on your tongue, either if it's slightly drying or oily, you get all of the bergamot at the back of your taste buds? I would say I, that was smoother, that was, yes, I, I would not have been able, without you telling me that, that yeah. there was oil there, but now you've told me, yes. I you have all that flavour. Well, I've certainly learned something today, thanks Julia. Perhaps one of the best things about Twining's flagship store on the Strand is you can take home a rather elegant gift, which is nowhere near the price it was 300 years ago.